This is the Inbound Planet Podcast, episode 16, Teaching Mathematics as Agape, and we are recording this with Sam Gilbert. You're going to hear from her in just a second, hear a little bit about her background and how she got to the University of Mississippi, but we're going to do a little something different. We're going to be talking about something that I wrote. It's a article from the Journal of Urban Mathematics Education called Teaching Mathematics as Agape, Responding to Oppression with Unconditional Love. So Sam is a doctoral student here at the University of Mississippi. She's also a licensed teacher. She's a teaching assistant. And I thought this would be a good thing to talk about, not only to share some of the stuff that I've done, some of the research and some of the work that I've done, but also to kind of get some of the background of this article and share that with Sam and just some of the kind of the things I was going through as I was in the same stages of doctoral work as she is now and thinking about what does all this mean for teaching, which is the purpose of this podcast, right, is to learn how to teach better. So what can we learn from this article on how to teach better? Getting me to think about it, given that I I wrote it a decent while ago, 2013, Um, thinking about how I can reconfigure this sort of knowledge in my head to think about how to teach better, but then how to live out this podcast purpose, which is to lead people to love others through teaching. And you kind of see like that purpose of the podcast kind of had its roots in some of my doctoral work and and all the thinking that went on into it. But don't want to delay too much longer. Want to get into it. Um, There is some questions that will get answered. We're going to go through the categories within the podcast. But also, I just want to point out that, again, you have sponsored this episode of the Amazon Planet Podcast. Thank you to all of you out there who have purchased a Be The Good shirt. Uh, I know some of you have been sending me pictures and stuff. It's fantastic. If you put them on Instagram or Facebook, that's even better because then we can kind of share them with others. But just such a a cool thing seeing everyone out there wearing those Be The Good shirts. If you want to get your own, you can head to AmazonPlanet.com. There's a link to the Amazon Planet store where you can find your own. As of the recording of this podcast, we got another batch being produced. So if you want to jump on that, do so immediately. Otherwise, as soon as somebody else orders one, we, we open up another window for creating another batch of, uh, of shirts. So again, all the proceeds from those sales go to supporting the podcast and really appreciate it out there. So again, sponsored by you, this episode of the Amazon Planet Podcast. No longer any delays. Let's get into it. Here's my discussion with Sam Gilbert on Teaching Mathematics as Agape. This is a special one. Uh, we get a chance to talk to uh, someone who's been in my life for a year and a half now, Sam Gilbert, Samantha Gilbert, Sam Gilbert. Sam. Mm-hmm. Sam. And she has been a teaching assistant here in the School of Education for, yeah, a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Right? A year and, and before half. that, well, I, why don't you introduce yourself, Sam? Well, before that, I got my undergraduate here at Ole Miss. I went straight into my master's program in curriculum and instruction. I was a graduate assistant under Dr. Jerry Lou Moore. After that, I went straight into teaching at Batesville Intermediate School. I worked there for four years teaching second graders. And now I'm back at Ole Miss working on my EDD in elementary education. Yes. And so Sam has been... um I'm going to say a rock star graduate candidate here at the in the Department of Teacher Education. Um, she she does excellent work. She does great work working with our teachers. And I was looking for somebody to have a conversation with about the article that we're going to talk about in just a second. And Sam came to mind one because we're gonna we're planning on doing another podcast yes. in the future that's around Sam's work. And mm-hmm. she is. Uh, Use the work uh, by Angela Duckworth, Grit, Grit. her book Grit, um, that I'm reading and I have not finished yet, so that's why (laughs) we need to do this in the meantime. But also, I wanted to share with her this article. It's called Teaching Mathematics as Agape, Responding to Oppression with Unconditional Love by Joel Amidon at the University of Mississippi. So I I wanted to share this article with, well, one, I wanted to have a conversation about this article, and it's better to talk with somebody than to talk by myself, and I think the listeners of the podcast can agree with that. But also, too, I want to share some of the background of it, given that you are in the process of getting your, your doctoral degree and thinking about, well, what might be the background, what, where is the background of this in my own dissertation and how it came about. So, um, again, we're going to have a conversation about the article. We're going to go through the categories in a bit, but first, maybe a little bit of background, and we'll just have, we're going to have a conversation about the article. So, one thing is that, yes, this did come from my dissertation. So this, this article that was published in Journal of Urban Math Education 
is a very condensed version of the lit review of my dissertation. So it's like, what, nine pages? Yes. Not too bad. Mm -mm. Reads okay, maybe. Yeah, it was great. I enjoyed reading it. She is honestly answering these questions. Honestly. Honestly. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a chance to put my lit review into JUME. Um, was a great opportunity. And how that opportunity came about was through this conference that's mentioned in the beginning part of the article, was this conference called the Privilege and Oppression in the Mathematics Preparation of Teacher Education Conference. Now, I was invited to that conference, I believe, because my advisor, my doctoral advisor at the mm -hmm. time, uh, was invited, and she knew I was uh, uh, just starting off at, here at Mississippi and knew this would be a, a good opportunity, knew it was right in the wheelhouse of the work that I did, so invited me uh, to this conference. And it was basically put on by... Michigan State, they had funds from the Connected Math Program, CMP. The CMP, it's a curriculum, very popular curriculum, uh, mm -hmm. sold out all, all over the country. And they, uh, they use funds to do some development stuff, and this conference was one of them. So I went up to the, I believe it was the Kellogg Mansion wow. in Battle Creek, Michigan. Yeah, it was the house that Frosted Flakes built. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of neat. Uh, so awesome. we went up there with a bunch of uh, scholars uh, from around the country and had this uh, very well-designed conference that a lot of stuff came out. And I, we could talk about it a little bit. Actually, this book that I have in mm -hmm. front of me that I've put on the table, The Cases for Mathematics Teacher Educators, it's a publication by AMTE, was thought up at that conference. Wow. And then also there's a, a grant, uh, there's a big grant that was uh, thought up at that conference, uh, Another project that I'm writing on um, was uh, the, there was a walk between Dan Beatty and myself where I asked him if I could use an article that he had some data in mm -hmm. for a project, and that project has now led to a number of different things. I mean, so... That's great. So this um, conference, did you present it, or were you just... It was. I mean, I say it's a conference. It was more like a gathering. Okay. It was a gathering. But then we did... We did a number of activities. We did a number of things. We kind of, it was kind of like a... A way to network. A way to network, to but it. also a way to like, hey, let's come up to a common understanding about some issues and things in our field. And that, let's come up with some ways to respond. And for how... And it, well, even this this um, issue of JUME was mm -hmm. kind of birthed out of that Got it. conference or like, gathering. Mm -hmm. Gathering is probably a better way to talk about Almost even a workshop. But anyway, so I, I point to that as like, there's really is value on getting people together and just getting people together. The power of people of getting just them together, having a conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. having a conversation, just like now. Just we're saying, having, yeah. we're having a conversation. Um, so yeah, that's so like those opportunities are they're out there to get to conferences and you think, well, you know, if I present or if I, you know, just go meet a couple of people, like there could be real power in Absolutely. those things. And some of the relationships that I, you know, the people I first met there. I'm looking forward to seeing those same people at the conference I'm going to next week. And so awesome. it's, and, and to think about what are the possibilities for work that we can do in the future. And then not only that, but then the relationships that sprung from those relationships, you know, it's just the web keeps, right. keeps going. So encouraging that and that. To Absolutely. I mean, even with just the few conferences I've been to the past year and a half, I've already made so many relationships that are still helping me and will continue to help me with my project that I'm yeah. working on. And just a little, let's just a little teaser on a your project. A little teaser. Yeah, yeah. So it's, and this is really interesting. What, so like, give a little tidbit on the project you're working on. So the project that I've been working on for the past three years is all about using the Rubik's Cube as an instructional tool in the elementary classroom to promote grit and growth mindset and how we can really push students out of their comfort zone, but not so far out that they quit. But it's giving them that perseverance and those lifelong skills that they will need to continue through their adulthood. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We're excited about the project that Sam's doing and um, excited to, again, have that conversation with mm -hmm. Grit. And we'll probably have more we can talk about uh, in a little bit. So um, just a little bit of background on this article. So when I was doing so I was in the same seat as you were, not literally, but... <laughs> back in Wisconsin, <laughs> thinking about what am I doing for my dissertation. <clears throat> and I kept coming up with this question, like, and, and it's kind of a personal question. It's, you know, it is, has its roots in my uh, spiritual life. But thinking about this idea of what does it mean to teach mathematics as an act of unconditional love, mm -hmm. right? I'm called to love others. And so, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm 
called to love others, but I'm a math teacher. Right. You know, and, and that's wh- when I started my doctoral work, and that's what I was at, and I identify as a math teacher. What does it mean to do that as a math teacher? And is it like, you know, is it just giving hugs out, you know? <laughs> or like, is it, you know, making Valentine's every day? And like, and, you know, having that kind of um, touchy-feely sort of idea of love, but really wanted to dive into, like, what does it mean, like, from a, given the literature, given, like, what we... What, what we know, right? Yeah, what we know in the field uh, on love. And so that got me into looking at, well, what are the different kinds of love? And so we have eros, we've got uh, phileo from, like, you know, Philadelphia, brotherly love. And then there's agape, uh, the idea of unconditional love. And really uh, trying to understand what agape was was comparing it to eros. Mm-hmm. So eros is like the Valentine's Day love. So it's okay. a, a love for the worthy and a love that desires to possess. You know, it's like, you know, seeing someone across the room and like, oh, I want to go meet them. And so that's eros versus agape is a love that's, in, this is a direct quote, given irrespective of merit, right? So I have unconditional love for whoever whoever's there right right? Mm -hmm. and so and thinking about that as opposed to agape and so a love that's given irrespective of merit and it made me think from in in looking at the article like made me think well what what do i as a math teacher if i'm giving irrespective of merit well what do i want to give right and so thinking about how i thought about um teaching and learning and mathematics and it kind of goes back to a previous episode of the podcast where we talk about teaching with problems okay and but you know that this because you've heard me say it over and over again it's about facilitating the relationship between the students and the content right, right? so absolutely relationship yeah, over content a relationship over content and thinking about how we then can use that relationship to develop uh, a relationship with, with content right. mm-hmm. and so um, thinking about then well what kind of relationship do I want to promote uh, with my students in the classroom and so there's basically four so looking at the literature and that's what's in the article there's mm-hmm. basically four facets one is a functional relationship that students can work with mathematics to achieve success as, as defined by society. So that's our traditional forms of you know, success. So it's test scores, it's ACT scores, it's getting into the next class. It's basically not having any door shut in your face because of your relationship in mathematics. Right. Right. And so, you know, and for us, you know, here we, we have students that need to pass praxis tests, mm-hmm. right, in order to... Move on to the next step. Yeah, and there's some stress there, and so we mm-hmm. want to make sure that they're rela- they have a functional relationship with mathematics so they can get to the next thing. Also, there is a uh, communal relationship with mathematics in that we can work in and with the practices of a student, uh, that students can work with mathematics uh, in and with the practices and the context of the students and their community, mm-hmm. right? And so that communal aspect is so like looking at what is a student bringing to the classroom? Can they use that learning mathematics? And what about their community context that they come from? Can they learn about their community? Can they uh, use what they know about their community to learn mathematics? Is there funds of knowledge from the community that we can use? Um, and I think that that one is, you know, like how, you know, we think about learning styles. We think about, you know, how people might express their understanding of stuff. That can break that out. We talk about inclusive education. A lot of that, those sorts of facets come into that communal, communal. You know, sort of perspective. And then, but then, you know what? I hate to break it to you, Sam, but we're not in a perfect world. Not at all. You know, so yeah. there's there's some brokenness out there. And so the mm-hmm. critical facet of um, the relationship is, can we work with mathematics? Can students work with mathematics to analyze and question society, right. analyze and question the world, right? Mm-hmm. And so... You know, a lot of that I, I got from, like, Rico Gutstein and even uh, Gloria Letts and Billings. They talk about a critical relationship with mathematics. And, you know, Rico would talk about reading the world, right? Can you read the world through mathematics? Can you understand you know, injustices? Can you use mathematics to see uh, where um, inequities might exist? And so... Oh, and just critique those social inequities. And, yeah. 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 I Question mean, it. Exactly. I mean, and that we can even look at our, you know, and even just look at our, at our situation when, you know, who is in our classrooms that mm-hmm. we're teaching right now, we're teaching teachers. And I mean, if we look at our classrooms that where we're doing teacher prep, those classrooms are not representative of society, right? We right. have a lot of people that look exactly the, the same, same. Mm-hmm. right? And from the same like demographic background. And so it's like, okay, 
we can question that and say, like, well, why is that? And how can we get it to be more representative of uh, the students that are in the classroom? In the classroom, to make it more relatable to those students. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're seeing some of that. We know that, you know, if students see, I mean, I guess I'll just talk about my own. I saw a lot of math teachers that looked like me. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that was some a case where I, when I struggled, I knew, like, well, the math teacher looks like me, you know. And I didn't probably think this like explicitly, but like, well, he made it, and like he made it, and he looks like me. He so looks I like can me. I, mm-hmm. I probably can make it too, right? right? Mm-hmm. Versus if you don't have those role models, I, mean, I don't know. Like, what do you do? Exactly. Um, and then finally, so like, it can be tough if, if everywhere you look at look in the world, all you see is problems. Mm-hmm. And I talk about this from a like a real true relationship perspective. Is if you've got somebody in your life that and I want their names, like, that just talks nothing but problems in your life. Can you name some? No, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, but if you think about that friend, and this goes for anybody, you can think of that friend that whenever you talk to them, it's like, woe is me. Something's always wrong. Something always mm-hmm. wrong. Complaining. Eeyore, you know? Eeyore. I mean, Eeyore yes. Like, yeah, like an Eeyore sort <laughs> like of Like an situation. Eeyore. Yeah, yeah. You got those Eeyores It's a good name life. for the Eeyores. Yeah. yeah. And so if, like, every, you know, so if we talk about having a relationship with mathematics, and if Every time you go hang out with mathematics, all you're doing is looking at the problems of the world, which there are lots of them. Mm-hmm. Um, if all of if all you saw was problems, then you might not want to <laughs> hang out with mathematics much. So let's let's have this additional facet. Let's have an inspirational facet where we can work, where students can work with mathematics to not only vision but work towards a better world. Right to have a change of perspective. Mm-hmm. They critique the problem, and then they work forward and see how to solve the problem. Right. So, like, it's not just looking at the problem, but it's thinking about envisioning a solution mm-hmm. and working towards it. Exactly. So, there we go. That's that's what I thought of when I thought of, okay, if I'm teaching mathematics as an act of unconditional love, and I'm, you think about love as a, as a giving irrespective of merit, what am I trying to give? I'm trying to give this relationship, this multifaceted relationship with mathematics that's both that's functional, communal, critical, and inspirational. And, and inspirational. Right. And then that the, the cliffhanger at the end is what does this look like? And so <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned and <laughs> to see actual practice. Yeah, 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 what that looks like in the classroom. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and that article is forthcoming. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this this is what I want to talk about. And, and part of the reason I want to talk about it, it's been a year since I started the podcast, mm-hmm. and I thought this would be a good thing to do around the 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 year mark. But also Absolutely. just wanted to to share this and you know there's only so many people that are going to the journal of urban math education and Mm so now i can not only post or can point to this article uh for work that i've done but we can point to the podcast exactly there we go that's great great resource yeah so all right so let's let's get into the categories okay ready i'm ready okay so we're we're talking about high five so our high five our top five learnings so between the two of us, I think we can come up we with five. We can come up with five. You want to sure. go first? Yeah. First off, after reading this, I mean, everything pointed out was great and, like we said, resourceful and can definitely help future teachers and teachers who are already in the field. Um, one thing that really stuck out was I'm not sure what it fell under, but when it was referring to the students in Brazil and mm-hmm. they were able to make and execute computations when they were selling fruit, in their neighborhoods, but yet when it came to the classroom and they were given similar math problems, they were not able to successfully complete those problems. Um, And that was, it just stuck out how there's no relation between what's going on in the real world and what's going on in the classroom because those kids could have easily, if they would have been guided using that same context that they had when selling the fruit, if that would have been the same way in the classroom, they would have made that connection and they could have seen, okay, so math is important, not just here, but I'm doing it every single day of my life. Right. Yeah. Wow. Could not have said this. Seriously, <laughs> we haven't talked before. Yet. So that article that was referenced in the uh, manuscript is one, is it, there's a, a volume on my shelf. It's called classics in math, ed- math education. Uh-huh. Okay. It's like the, uh, the, you know, wow hits of math education Mm -hmm. sort of music sort of playlist. Anyway, so that article basically was like this big um, aha article that shift ideas about what does it mean to transfer? What does this mean about 
the social context for mm-hmm. learning. I mean, really brought in this idea of like this way of being. We have a way of being in the classroom. We have a way of being when we're selling fruit. And, you know, we thought maybe there'd be this equivalence between them. But right. there is something about the, situa- the situations. situation. Yeah. Exactly. Because it's even when I talk to my students and we're working on their lesson plans and we're integrating math and other content areas and they want to just throw in a word problem. And the word problem might deal with football, but it in reality has no context to actual football. Yeah, yeah. Instead of talking about, oh, the yards gained or how many touchdowns, it could just be a random word problem just including the word football. <laughs> yeah. And so it's just a reach for the students to make that connection. Whereas if it's actually put into the context, it brings a whole new meaning. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, Billy gained 5,000 yards in one exactly. game. Exactly. Like, what? <laughs> No context. No, 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 not at all. But yeah, it's like thinking about the idea of what does it mean to be smart in mm-hmm. these situations. And like in the, that article, they were, you know, these kids were probably marked as smart in the, you know, good business people mm-hmm. in the streets. But in the in the, the classroom, classroom, it was like they're failing. And it's like, how do we bridge these situations? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, when I was a doc student, I had to do this like a project where we would go and shadow, um, just learn about some uh, an out of school context okay. and so i went to a place where they were playing magic the gathering kind of like pokemon okay. but scarier mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> never heard of that yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. and i didn't know what i was doing but i heard this kid talking in um about a deck that he had built so you build like a deck that has like probability that of different things would happen it's right. random but it's mm-hmm. like it's like you make your own card deck uh-huh. okay and he's like this deck it some people think it's a a junk deck, like it's kind of like a, uh, a something, you know, kind of a, uh, like it won't actually work, but it's kind of cool to put up, but it actually does work because I did, <laughs> I tweaked this and this and, and he, I mean, basically laying out yeah, a map. whole system, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, laying out a proof. Well, the thing is, I see that kid in the classroom the next day, unreal, like I, like I'm doing an observation the next day, so I was doing classwork on that night and the right. next day I was doing an uh, observation, I see the same kid and I hear him being talked about as being not uh, not able to do mathematics, uh, was being kicked out of the classroom for not doing his work. I mean, just like was... All these problems. It was yeah. kind of the same as the mm-hmm. Brazil sort of situation. It's like, wow, how do we bridge these situations? Because this kid is, I mean, I, brilliant. Exactly. Like, and yet it's not being be recognized. Out to, yeah. Yeah. And so what I like that you pointed that out is like this difference between school math and real world math real world math Mm -hmm. but then how do we bring those closer together together. right awesome cool Uh, man i could not have planned that (laughs) read your mind fantastic so uh one thing that you know well do you want to do another one or do you want me to go um sure so i also pointed out when the article is talking about uh, bowler's comparison between Mm -hmm. the two types of math approaches so one was an open-ended project-based approach and the other was the traditional procedural approach and so the study revealed that female students scored significantly lower than male students when it was just the traditional approach but in reverse when they were doing the open-ended project-based approach the um, girls had way more confidence and they proved to have significant gains in confidence and understanding and that stood out because I feel like when I was in elementary and all the way to my senior year I learned math in a very traditional manner Um, it was old school math not how we try to teach our teachers now to teach math and I think that that kind of was brought with me when I went into the classroom. Those mm-hmm. same concepts of how I learned math. Also, it took me a little bit to shake that and mm-hmm. really think about what is an open-ended, project-based approach when learning math and teaching math. Yeah. And and then also then knowing that, you know, this could be a, a better way to reach exactly. all, of my, all of my students. And a more equitable experience instead of just focusing all males versus females and what works for all of them so I can meet their needs. Yeah. And like having the perspective like, okay, in, in that study, the, the males didn't do any differently, but the females are drastically different. Right. Uh, and you think like, okay, well, why, 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 would we would, do, why wouldn't we do what works? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And thinking about too, with the perspective of the power of how we were how we were taught and just knowing that we have to question examine mm-hmm. that, that our default is is how we've seen it done before and but 
the question, is that the right thing to do? Right? Now, right. especially with the world changing at a constant rate. Yeah, so we need that. <laughs> we that need to keep our thinking. teaching, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You got another one, or you want me to go? Um, and then one more that I picked out was when you were referring to how the critical component is achieved when teachers prompt students to understand and critique those social inequities, which is kind of what we talked about before we got started. Mm -hmm. But just being able to ask the right questions and for teachers to prompt their students to think big and to think outside of what's just happening in this classroom, but in the world as a whole. Yeah, that's good. Can you think of any examples like that from your own perspective? Um, the one that it was talking about in the article when it was referring to global warming mm. and how the students really looked at it from the world view instead of just what's happening maybe in their city, in their state. Yeah. Getting it's, a bigger picture. To think bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing that we did in our um, classroom, it was looking at uh, income distribution and there's a book called Rethinking Mathematics where there's a... Um, I've read that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The... the uh, and which one did, did you see the one where they split up the cookies? Or? Yes, and then I, I, what comes to mind too is when they were planning for um, a fiesta or some kind of party and they were having different incomes and they were trying to collaborate to see what's fair, what's not, what makes it equal with having a different income. Mm, yeah, yeah. And like just it opens kids' eyes to, yeah, the, I mean, there is a, I mean, not open their eyes. They know. I mean, right, yes. Kids see inequity they see all the time. They see way more than we think they see. Right. I mean, just even, you know, thinking about what kids wear to school, what mm-hmm. kids are, you know, how kids get to school. Even, like, I've tried to point it out to my um, pre-service teachers, like, where kids sit in the lunchroom without being, if you're not being aware, and I've seen some teachers in our local school district being really aware of the situation where if and this is the setup for this lunchroom, is that kids go in the lunchroom and some kids go get a tray lunch. Right. Okay. Some have their lunch box. And some have their lunch mm-hmm. box. And if you just let them go to the table, you're going to have lunch boxes and, and trays, trays, which there is a there's um, a lack of mixing uh, of students there, right? Right. And so I've seen teachers that are like, okay, what we're going to do, uh, box Mm-hmm. Tray, box, tray, box, tray. Make a pattern. Mm-hmm. Make sure that, yeah, make a, make a pattern. Make a pattern. Yeah, make sure that, you know, if there's kids that are getting, you know, free and reduced lunch, that doesn't mean that we're all sitting together, right? And, and that, which happens to be the case in mm-hmm. our local district. Um, and and so, it is just being aware of that. Being aware. And like being it's aware. something as just small as that. Just noticing those small things. Yeah. And so, like, how can we make sure that students are, um, students are interacting not based off some weird default that we're not thinking about, but making sure that we're being intentional with mm-hmm. all our decisions. Absolutely. And so it took a teacher to analyze and question their world in order to look at that, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's good. Um, I, I'm going to jump into one. Yes, okay? go for it. So the one thing that I kept, and this was, I guess, as a kid, I was thinking about it, and this seems, this seems silly, <laughs> that love is powerful. Absolutely. Love is a battlefield. No, not love. <laughs> Start singing all yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember as a kid, like, all of a sudden, like, having this aha moment, and I don't know when it was, but, like, all of these songs, a lot of them are about love. <laughs> like, the majority. Yeah, or, like, um, about, uh, or the, these movies, a lot of them about love. And it's like, it's this, like, it's a very powerful thing that's out there. And then, you know, again, going into you know, faith and spirituality, and I've had conversations with people from a variety of religions, like love is like this, almost like this universal thing that Mm -hmm. we can attach to. And then you think about what calls a teacher to teach. And a lot of times you can put, well, I love kids. You know, there's this... It comes down to loving children. Yeah, there's Mm -hmm. these, this, this thing. And so like how to tap into that and tap into it, not as a, um, like, like what we started off the podcast with, not as this love, you know, the... Just on the surface. Surface yeah, level. Right. You know, not this, you know, um, kind of weak thing. I, I don't want to say weak, but I mean. But it's almost like what is, love is motivating. Like what part, how is it motivating teachers or to yeah. do what you want to do? Right. And like my friend Gary, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, like he's openly talks about, you know, loving, uh, like every time we have a conversation, you say, hey, I love you. Mm-hmm. And like. And I know that, that what that love means is like, man, he will do anything for me. He will go to bed for me. He will, um, you know, if I need him, he'll be he'll there. Be there. Mm-hmm. And you think like, 
you know, that's what we what we want from our teachers. Absolutely. And so how do we treat it as a serious thing? And actually there's a quote that is in um, in the article that I really like from Freire where he talks about, um, oh, that we must dare in the full sense of the word to speak of love without the fear of being called ridiculous, mawkish, or unscientific, if not anti-scientific. And so that comes down to, and, and this goes back to you, so when I had my dissertation committee, mm-hmm. my uh, my chair, Anita Wagger, um, try to get on the podcast, another, <laughs> uh, and then Gloria Latson billings was on it, and like, Erica Halverson, Audrey Trainer, Eric Knuth, Rico Gutstein. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. They were all willing for me to use this idea in in this study. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And, like, I just think that, they, like, for them to be able to support me in doing that and knowing that I can use this form in a, like a, in a scientific way and back it up with some real research to say, like, Hey, this is a this is a this thing. is a thing, a real thing. And I hope, and, and that's I guess my hope for putting this out there is that you know other people can do the same, right? right. And, and I think a lot of people who might have had the same traditional math background as I did can see it from a different perspective, and they can shake those old habits and bring to the table some new ideas and see it from a worldview and see how they can use math as a way to teach students to love that relationship with the world and things that are going on in their surrounding areas. Yeah. Yeah, to have, like, it's not just learning the algorithm. It's not yes, just it's not just formulas. four plus three. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So that was one of my, my learning, and, like, thinking in hindsight about the article. Mm-hmm. And then also just thinking about the what to give, you know, and, and so it's the kind of more formulation of the idea is, like, okay, beyond the love, like, and we hear our students talk about loving their kids. And so, like, okay, so where do we push, point that energy to? Right. Because sometimes, you know, without the direction, we might think, like, mm, I'm seeing my kids struggle, my students struggle in class. I love them. I want to remove struggle from them. Mm-hmm. And without having maybe the bigger idea, like, you know what, that could be the actually the opposite of loving that kid. Mm-hmm. By removing that struggle, by not allowing them to have that perseverance that and you that talk about. That productive struggle, work, right. That productive the struggle. productive struggle of it. I am not loving my, I mean, I'm actually harming an, this yeah, child. And so giving them some, giving, the, giving some background to mm-hmm. it, to think like, well, what is it? What might it, again, what might it look what like? What might it look like? And overall, after like looking at the article as a whole, it really comes down to setting your students up for success. And it gives them that, if you have that relationship and you have that love for math and that love for all the things you're teaching and all the content, area, content areas, you are setting them up for success. And that in itself is love because mm-hmm. you want the best for them, whether it's giving them a productive struggle or letting them see it from a different perspective or a different viewpoint or looking at global problems. Mm-hmm. That's helping them become a better adult as yeah. they keep going forward. And, uh, and not just the success of... Like we said, talked about the functional mm-hmm. side, but it's like it's almost like a successful member of society. Society, and yeah. that's what we all aim for. That's right. That's right. Right. That's right. Um, all right. So that, that's our high five. High five. We, we got through that. So that's great. Now you know. So like looking mm-hmm. back, let's say you had this as a beginning teacher or right. wherever you had it. Mm-hmm. Um, how might this inform what you did? Um, it kind of goes back to. Once again, me referring to my traditional math background, um, I've always had an educational philosophy of relationship over content. But what that looked like in my Which first year of teaching, and the teacher and the yes. students love too. And what that looked like in my first year of teaching would not necessarily reflect how I see relationship over content now. If I was going to go back into the classroom, um, basically. What I mean is instead of just having my students as passive receivers and me getting to know them, but yet I'm still just giving them information and I'm using the textbook or I'm using the curriculum that was given to me as a first year teacher, that was not necessarily setting them up for success because it is more than just a textbook. Mm -hmm. So if I could go back and redo some of my first years of teaching, it would be definitely to make it more actively engaged and for them to be really involved in what math looks like and not just what it looks like in this classroom and in this textbook. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess for me too, similarly, going back to my original teaching, and it kind of goes back into learning, so giving myself like a target, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just 
and, and I know we both are talking about this, like if we had more foresight versus like, man, we're just trying to, <laughs> just trying, <laughs> trying to, survive. to survive. Yeah. But thinking about like, okay, it's not just about success as a student. It's about learning about this community so we can mm-hmm. put some of that into our classroom. It's about building those relationships with the students. It's about having a vision for this, you know, what could this community be? What could the world be? Right. And, you know, having a target for that versus like... They have to pass a test. Yeah, it's just test. a lot more to it. And I would go back and rethink what... I would rethink and de- redefine success in yeah. that matter. There yeah. You go. Well, and that, and that too, and, and I think some of the times, like, you know, we might, there might be some teachers out there, but, but yeah, we still got to pass that test. Right. Well, I think if, and this is my argument, and I mm-hmm. wonder if you, if we're looking at bigger problems, right, and we're envisioning and working towards a better world, that there's like this, almost like in, the inspirational facet of it, mm-hmm. uh, critical and inspirational facet, that might speak to some kids so that they want to learn the functional side. They might want to better learn those formulas. They'll respect the, it more. Respect mm-hmm. it more. Like, I'm seeing what I can do. Oh, wow. It's not just school math that I'm learning. I'm learning this math that exists outside of these walls. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Awesome. So for me, yeah, I said I just need that target. Okay. So what about going forward? Okay, so and here's the scenario. Mm-hmm. And this is an easy one to think of. We, we train teachers. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. How does this how does this help us do that? Um, well, I think with me when I'm training teachers and when I'm helping them with prepping for their lesson plans or for them going into the observations, I want them to understand the importance of being able to equip their students with the confidence and when we talk about success with how they can actually help and go solve these problems instead of looking them at them as something that's scary or big or something out of their reach. It's what can we do to teach our pre-service teachers how they can go into the classroom and equip their students with the essential skills necessary to tackle all of this and for mm-hmm. them to see it as a bigger picture. Nice, nice. I mean, I, yeah, and to, to understand it as, as multifaceted and not just this... Not this, just a computation on paper. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's like regurgitation of what we saw. Right. I see, too, as... You know, I, I, I kind of went backwards a little bit, and actually there was something that we did here at the at the prompt conference that where we looked at we looked at target non target. So like look, so thinking about me as a white male Christian middle class like educate like you look at all those things and like I there's a lot of privilege mm-hmm. that's been coming my way, and so when I'm thinking about my position given all that privilege as a now teacher of teachers and think about how do I how do I foster this sort of uh, wanting students to develop these sorts of relationships with mathematics how do I teach teachers to do that without um, without leaning leaning on that privilege right because sometimes that you know like with things that you might have access to. Right. Like, mm-hmm. And like not overlooking it and mm-hmm. thinking like, you know, for me to go do something in the classroom is different than somebody else with different demographic characteristics. Right. You mm-hmm. know, and not to forget that and not um, and try to make it. Well, there's an article that I really like. I think I've mentioned it on this podcast before. It's don't say anything. A, a kid, kid can't a say. Kid can right. Say. Mm-hmm. And so if, a, you know, don't say anything, a, another teacher could say that we're training in the classroom and seeing, like, how can, how can we use some of these same principles right. that we want to use in, in our classrooms? How can I use it in my classroom where I'm teaching teachers, where they get opportunities to bring these principles up you know, through experiences that I've set up, but they've mm-hmm. all they get chances to share and learn uh, about and them. And share their perspective on the exactly. situation. And mm-hmm. it's not just me telling them how to do it, right? Right. Cause then, Showing like, versus telling. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. So building those experiences so that they can they can see them for themselves. That's good. All right, so final thing. Mm-hmm. Sum for a seven-year-old. Sum it up for a seven-year-old, which would be a second grader. That's right. Right, right yep. in my alley. Uh-huh. Um, I would basically just explain that math is a lifelong skill that is needed and can help you be successful as an adult, whether that be in the work, working world or just like we talked about, a citizen of the community and how that can help them as they move forward and as they push through difficulties that they might see in their life. Good. Yeah. What yeah. about you? I, w- I would 
point back to this idea of kind of like math as a friend. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a friend that you... You can build a relationship yeah, you with. you can build a relationship with, and it's a friend you can work with in school, a friend you see in your community. I like that. A friend you can uh, dream about the future with, uh-huh. or a friend you can look at problems with. Right? And, and so, solve problems with. And so we want to continue to develop that relationship with mathematics. I like that. Math as a friend. Math as a friend. You got a friend and... You know, <laughs> stop singing. Well... Lots of teens. Yeah. Well, Sam... Thank you. Thank so you, Dr. Amidon. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Joel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you for being willing to uh, um, engage in this conversation. Thank you for reading the article. Absolutely. I um, enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to our future podcast yes, on grit, grit sometime in the near future. Mm-hmm. Um, and also looking forward to thinking about where your project is going to be at that point in right. time. I know you're I'm excited. doing some professional development and presentations mm-hmm. on Got using the cube. presentations so, coming up. So maybe we'll be able to promote some of those on that podcast That would as be well. great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also just, uh, yeah, I, I'm appreciative for you as someone who is making a mark for themselves here in the School of Education at the University of Mississippi that when I ask students if they have you in class, they say yes and they smile. <laughs> and so I know that you are not only caring for them, uh, in preparing them to be teachers, but you're also caring for them as people. And so, thank you. It sounds like you are teaching as agape. Uh, I'm as trying. Well. I'm trying. Very good. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's it. That's all we're going to have. And so, awesome. the show notes for this episode are going to be at amazonplanet.com forward slash episode 16. So, we've mentioned a few things. So, we'll put some links to that in the uh, show notes. You can also, if you want to support the podcast, you can subscribe, rate, and review. You know, do all those good things. You can join the Amadon Planet email list. Uh, you can find that on amadonplanet.com. There's a button there. You can also find it on the Facebook page. Um, you can also, there's some Amazon links in the uh, Amazon links uh, in the show notes and in other show notes if you use those and click around and you buy a book or something else, you it, some of that can help support the podcast. You can also find me on the interwebs at Amazon Planet on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Again, big thank you to Sam mm-hmm. for joining me. Also, big thanks to Matt Mifflin for sharing some of his music in this episode. And finally, thank you to all of you out there who are seeking to teach better and be the good in the world by investing in the lives of others. This world is a better place because you have decided to use the gifts you have been given to serve others. Thank you for all that you do. Peace.